Hello. I want to thank you all for coming, especially since I know it's um, baseball night. <laughs> But we promise you'll be done in time for the game, well in time for the game. Um, my name is Ann Helmreich, and I'm the director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities. And on behalf of the center and our associate director, Mary Davis, I want to welcome you here this afternoon. And I also want to thank the Office of Interdisciplinary Programs um, and Linda Gilmore for everything she does to help us support these programs. Um, before I introduce the speaker, a little housekeeping. Um, if you have a cell phone with you, could you either put it on silent or turn it off? That would be wonderful. Um, second, on the way in, you should have received a comment card. And we really appreciate hearing from you, getting your feedback. So um, we'll collect those um, at the exits on the way out. So um, if you could take the time to do that at the end. Um, at the end. And uh, third, you should have received a flyer about our upcoming events. And if you didn't, please see one of us, and we're happy to give you one. Um, we have more things coming up. This afternoon's lecture is the second in a series of talks devoted to the theme of cityscapes. And the Baker Nord Center chose the theme of cityscapes for this year's programming because it seemed exceedingly pertinent to the times and place in which we live. Moreover, we wanted to explore and share with the community the role that the humanities play in interpreting and thinking critically about the urban environment. And today's speaker fulfills that role superbly. Thomas Segru is the Edmund J. and Louise Kahn Professor of History and Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania and has devoted his professional career to the study of urban history, race relations, and American politics. We are pleased to welcome him to the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities as a short-term visiting fellow. Dr. Segru earned his MA in British History from the Cambridge University and his MA and PhD in American History from Harvard. He has been teaching at the University of Pennsylvania since 1991, and um, he's an award-winning teacher there. But I wanted to make you aware of some things he does outside the classroom. He's the vice chair of the Philadelphia Historical Commission. He's the co-chair of the Bread and Roses Community Fund, a foundation that supports grassroots organizations working for racial and economic equality. And he's also been called upon to serve as an expert witness in recent federal lawsuits at the University of Michigan concerning affirmative action and Euclid, Ohio, here in Euclid, Ohio, concerning voting rights. Now, Dr. Segru's list of publications as well as awards and recognition is quite lengthy and testimony to a productive and perceptive mind. But in light of our theme of cityscapes, I just want to call your attention to two pieces of work in particular. The first is his book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, Race and Inequality in Post-War Detroit, which was selected by Princeton University Press as one of its 100 most influential texts. It was awarded the Bancroft Prize in History, the Philip Taft Prize in Labor History, the Urban History Association Prize for the Best Book in North American Urban History, among other recognitions. And I think this book is particularly pertinent for us here in Cleveland and has much to offer us in terms of coming to grips with our past. It examines, in Professor Segru's own words, the contested terrain of the post-war city, the unresolved dilemmas of housing, segregation, industrial relations, racial discrimination, and deindustrialization. Um, I recommend the book in its entirety, but if you um, want to leapfrog to the end, I really would recommend, in particular, his conclusion. Um, which deals with the question of urban transformation and the legacy of post-war Detroit's economic and social history. And in particular, his invitation to develop, in his words, creative responses piece by piece to the interconnected forces of race, residence, discrimination, industrial decline, and the consequences of a troubled and still unresolved past. That phrase, unresolved past, makes a compelling case for why history and the humanities can contribute to so much to our analysis of the cities. And our understanding of what makes the cities undergoing change, we now understand the cities and suburbs to be inextricably intertwined. And this brings us to Tom Segru's current work, which is looking at the suburbs. In a collection of essays he edited, he and his colleague demonstrated that the myth of suburbia as a leave it to beaver sort of haven of contentment is purely that, a myth and that the suburbs, like the cities, were places of struggle. This is the subject of tonight's lecture by Professor Segru, entitled Jim Crow's Last Stand, The Struggle for Civil Rights in the Suburban North. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Segru. Great, I want to thank Anne for her kind introduction and uh, 
it's great to be back in Cleveland, and uh, I'm only sorry that I have to compete with the Cleveland Indians, even in my Little League days when my batting average was a dismal 100, um, only because every one in ten times the ball and the bat are, are, are likely to connect because of the laws of physics. Uh, it's, a, it's tough competition, but uh, I, I, uh, uh, my only sadness about uh, the forthcoming World Series, which will certainly involve the Indians, is that um, my adopted hometown team, the Phillies, won't be facing them in what would have been a great match. In any case, um, I'm writing a book, or I've just finished writing a book, it's actually in the uh, last stages of editing as we speak, on the history of civil rights in the North from the Great Depression to the present. It's a long sweep exploring a, a topic that um, I, I hope to show you this evening um, uh, really needs a lot more examination. I started grappling with this project. I started grappling with the history of civil rights in the North, in part as an outgrowth of my work on Detroit, uh, but also because um, I had to confront, uh, especially over the last several years as we've celebrated a whole series of anniversaries, of major moments, of landmarks in the history of civil rights, had to confront the paradox that 60 years after the publication of Gunnar Myrdal's American Dilemma, uh, arguably the most influential book on race relations written in the 20th century, uh, uh, 60 years or so after the end of the Second World War, which was an extraordinary moment of grassroots black act activism um, around the country, north and south, F just a little more than 50 years after the landmark Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education, 40 years after the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, uh, and the 1968 uh, uh, amendment to the Civil Rights Act that uh, forbade discrimination in housing, uh, just a little more than 30 years after the landmark Supreme Court decision uh, in uh, Millikan versus Bradley dealing with metropolitan uh, school desegregation uh, in the Detroit area. Despite the enormous shifts and changes, the landmark uh, moments of activism and uh, uh, the extraordinary um, litigation that has occurred, um, we have to confront a paradox. And that paradox, that paradox is that patterns of racial inequality in the United States remained deeply entrenched, especially in housing and, and, and in education. And those patterns of racial inequality are most deeply entrenched not in the region of the country uh, that has attracted most of our scholarly and media attention, the South, but instead uh, in the North. If you consider or, or consider a few facts for the moment, uh, a, a few facts that point to this paradox of persistent r racial inequality, particularly in the North. Today, 23 of the 25 most segregated metropolitan areas in the United States are in the Northeast and the Midwest. Here are the top 10. Detroit, Gary, Milwaukee, Chicago, Cleveland, Buffalo, Newark, New York City, Cincinnati, and St. Louis. The states with the highest degrees of educational segregation by race are also uh, uh, disproportionately in the Northeast uh, and in the Midwest. To understand the paradox of persistent uh, uh, racial segregation and racial inequality in the North requires going back and grappling with the relatively little told history of racial inequality in the North and examining the struggles against that racial inequality uh, led by African American and white activists over the course of the long 20th century. The history of the struggle of racial, uh, uh, the history of the struggle for racial equality in the North has been almost completely overshadowed by uh, the voluminous scholarship and, and representations and images in popular culture of the Southern movement. The vast majority of the near library of books and articles on the history of civil rights focuses on the South, and I would argue to the great detriment of our understanding of race relations in modern America. The commonplace histories of civil rights, the ones that we teach our students, the ones that are represented in films, uh, the ones that still shape um, public policy and, uh, and jurisprudence, uh, the commonplace histories of civil rights begin in 1954 and 1955. 1954 being the year of the landmark Brown versus Board of Education decision, uh, 1955 being uh, the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott or what historians sometimes call the classic phase uh, of the civil rights movement. This history of civil rights follows a compelling storyline 
usually through the life of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and the organizations to which he was most closely affiliated, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And his history culminates uh, in the abolition of de jure Jim Crow and the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Southern story, the history of the Southern freedom struggle, is at heart a morality tale, which is why we tell it and retell it and tell it again. It's a tale that in some ways speaks to uh, a, a current in American popular culture, going back indeed you know, to the colonial period, one that looks at American history in terms of sin, of redemptive suffering, uh, and ultimately of redemption in, in, in the case of the story being told through the life of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and the Southern freedom struggle, the redemptive suffering being that of African-American activists in the South, uh, and the redemptive suffering being indeed the martyrdom of the Reverend King himself in service of the goal of racial equality. It's a compelling story, and it's one uh, that gets told again and again and will continue to be told again and again precisely uh, because of this powerful narrative arc that speaks to some of the deepest currents in American society. Like all morality tales, the history of the Southern freedom struggle hinges on binaries, on dualistic oppositions, color blindness versus color consciousness, integration versus separation, or as it's commonly put in shorthand, Martin that is Martin Luther King Jr. versus Malcolm, that is Malcolm X. The story has uh, uh, two endings that uh, uh, kind of uh, reinforce its moralistic implications. The happy one, which is the civil rights legislation of the 1960s profoundly altered race relations in the United States and uh, in the most optimistic view, removed the last remaining formal barriers to racial equality in the United States thus leaving any lingering racial inequality in the United States the result of the individual behavioral or cultural deficiencies of African Americans and not uh, the result uh, of laws or institutions or structures. A related ending, uh, you could say, is the darker ending, and this is usually where the North shows up as tragic denouement to this otherwise glorious story of Southern redemption. Here, uh, the argument goes that the movement went north and there it crashed apart on the shoals of black power and the urban riots. The history of the black freedom struggle in the north, however, uh, is virtually non-existent. We only have a few moments when the North flashes into the consciousness of historians, of students and in, in popular culture, uh, namely Martin Luther King Jr.'s ill-fated trip to Chicago in 1966, or the Ocean Hill-Brownsville busing, uh, a school decentralization crisis of 1968, or the Boston busing crisis in the mid-1970s, all of which served to confirm uh, the, 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 the story about the North as the place where the great hopes uh, of the Southern freedom struggle crashed apart uh, on uh, the shoals of identity politics and of Northern racial division. Well, I don't want to diminish for a moment the accomplishment of the generation of historians, of oral historians, of filmmakers, uh, of journalists, uh, of social scientists who've written compellingly about the Southern movement. To put a point on it, the story of racial inequality and the struggles against it in the North beginning much earlier than 1954 and 1955. The story of the struggle for racial, for racial equality in the North greatly complicates our understanding of America's racial crisis. For how we remember the past has real stakes for the present. And our nostalgia for the civil rights era, uh, our after the fact identification uh, with the civil rights struggle in the South ultimately obscures more than it reveals. By commemorating the history of the Southern freedom struggle, and it needs to be commemorated, uh, by commemorating the history of the Southern freedom struggle at the exclusion of uh, the more complicating history of the North, by talking about how far we have overcome, by denigrating the Northern struggle for racial uh, equality, we collectively uh, let ourselves as Americans off the hook. So my new project takes the North as its focal point and explores the still largely unwritten histories of grassroots struggles for racial equality involving blacks and whites, 
uh, leftists and liberals uh, and their conservative opponents, involving activists who were profoundly secular and those who were deeply motivated by religious beliefs, all of whom collectively transformed race in modern America, but whose struggles remain partial, incomplete, unfinished. The battle for racial equality in the North took place on many fronts. And before I get into the subject of tonight's talk uh, in more detail, I just want to focus very quickly on a few because all of these played out uh, uh, on the terrain of cities and suburbs. And in fact, in sometimes small cities, uh, 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 a type of place that I've spent much more time exploring than I had imagined when I began the project. For example, in the 1930s and 40s, and continuing in some places as late as the 1960s, northern activists challenged unequal public accommodations in movie theaters, which customarily sat African Americans uh, along the side aisles or in the balcony, which was usually nicknamed the crow's nest, uh, 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 in restaurants, which regularly excluded African American patrons in major northern cities, uh, despite the presence in many of those places of, uh, of civil rights laws that forbade it, uh, the exclusion of African American customers from hotels, uh, the systematic segregation of whites and African Americans in public pools and beaches and amusement parks. Uh, this is a story uh, that is very familiar to those of us who know the history of the Southern freedom struggle, where public accommodations, where restaurants and sit ins became a common tactic. But it's one that played out all over the place in the North, uh, particularly uh, in and around the Second World War and uh, into the 1950s. It's an enormously important story, in part because many of the activists who went on to challenge segregation at lunch counters and other public accommodations in the South had cut their teeth or had learned the tactics of activism from Northern activists who had done it first in the 1930s, the 1940s, and 1950s. It's an amazing, important, and incredibly interesting story, and I could talk about it for the rest of tonight, but I won't. Beginning in the 1930s and continuing through the 60s and 70s, activists in the North also challenged uh, workplace discrimination, beginning with the uh, uh, boycotts of the 1930s, nicknamed the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaigns, where African-American consumers boycotted stores and other businesses that had no black employees, even though they had black customers. In the period from World War II through the early 1960s, a remarkable rainbow coalition of northern activists, religious activists coming from the mainstream Protestant denominations uh, and uh, Jewish congregations, labor activists, uh, and civil rights uh, uh, groups, uh, black and white, and in some places Puerto Rican, uh, pushed for the passage of state and local fair employment practices or anti-discrimination laws, leading to a slew of these laws uh, being, in, being enacted in ways that foreshadowed uh, the important civil rights legislation uh, in 1964. Their, their activism, including an increasingly militant attempt to open up all white segments of the workforce, particularly public employment and the construction industry, led to large-scale protests in the streets of major cities, including Philadelphia and Cleveland, uh, in uh, the early and mid-1960s, uh, and uh, gave a grassroots impetus to the creation of the policy of affirmative action, uh, prob probably the most controversial legacy of the social movements of this period. Beginning in the 1940s uh, and coming to a peak in the 1960s and beyond, northern activists in nearly every city protested against the police and against the police uh, mishandling of African Americans, especially young African American men, but also uh, against grievances that the police were not providing protection in African American communities. The history of police community relations, uh, uh, of African American police community relations in particular, is worthy of a whole book in its own right, beginning with slave patrols and, and ending with uh, uh, the O.J. Simpson trial um, uh, or beyond. Uh, uh, my project looks at this as a central flashpoint for organizing um, and activism uh, in the mid-20th century. And it's one uh, that also gave impetus in part uh, to the urban uprisings of the 1960s as well uh, as is better known, the history of black power. One of the most interesting and important and nearly completely unknown stories in the history of civil rights in the North um, and one uh, that played out especially in suburban locales were challenges by black activists, mostly African-American women, uh, to racially segregated or separate schools, public schools. 
beginning early in the century, uh, but um, coming to a peak at two moments, in and around World War II uh, and in the immediate aftermath of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Almost all of our attention is focused on the battle against segregated schools in the South, but activists in the North, in places as diverse as Berwyn, Willow Grove, and Chester, Pennsylvania, Toms River, Englewood, Mapleshade, Montclair, and Princeton, New Jersey, Hillsboro, Dayton, and Shaker Heights, and Springfield, Ohio, uh, uh, Hilburn, Hempstead, New Rochelle, and New York City, just to name a few of the places I explore, uh, engaged in large uh, African-American-led boycotts of public schools, forcing the hand of uh, the NAACP's litigation team uh, to take on northern cases when it was trying to direct most of its attention to the South, and in the process, changing the terrain of debate about race and education in profound ways. Most of the stories that we tell about the battle against school desegregation, particularly in the North, is a top-down story of lawyers imposing their agenda on the grassroots. But what I found in examining these battles all over the place in small and large cities and suburbs is more often than not, it was grassroots activists in the localities that dragged the lawyers uh, uh, in, uh, uh, demanding their support in their challenge to racially separate and unequal education. An amazingly interesting and important story. Grassroots activists were also involved beginning with the cooperative movement of the 1930s and moving into the community economic development movement of the 1960s and beyond uh, in calling for uh, self-determination and community economic control in ways that ironically often led to peculiar alliances between some of the most radical black activists and even nationalists uh, with mainstream liberals and even uh, in the 1970s, the Republican Party. Another very interesting story uh, full of ironies and also with significant implications for public policy today. Well, of all of the civil rights battles in the North, uh, and I could keep listing these forever, but that would be boring. Uh, of all the civil rights battles in the North, perhaps none was more consequential than the struggle against the multiple reinforcing inequalities of race and place, specifically the battle to open up housing in suburbia, to provide equal opportunity for housing uh, in housing for African Americans, which is going to be my focus today. Of all of the changes that remade America in the 20th century, of all the changes, few were more momentous and had more enduring effects than the mass migration of whites to suburbia beginning in the mid-20th century, coterminous with the rise of the African-American freedom struggle. Northern suburbia is a particularly revealing place to examine the history of civil rights because it is there in northern suburbs that black-white segregation has remained the most persistent and intractable. Despite more than a half century of the liberalization of white attitudes about race, integration, and housing, the degree of racial segregation in northern metropolitan and midwestern metropolitan areas uh, would have pleased all but the most intransigent architects of Southern style Jim Crow. Post-war suburbanization simultaneously created and reinforced racial inequalities in, on several different levels. First, it created racially segregated real estate markets underwritten by federal housing and tax policy, supported by private real estate practices, and sustained by individual and collective action on the part of whites uh, who resisted African Americans moving into their communities. And as a wide range of sociological studies have shown, where you live, what the value of your real estate is, is the primary determinant of most Americans' wealth, uh, even more so at mid-century than today. Uh, but the long-term consequences of this racial separation and segregation in housing, among other things, has uh, uh, helps to explain uh, the shockingly large gap. One, uh, uh, African Americans today have about one-tenth the average household wealth of that of white Americans, in large part because of disparities in the value of real estate and disparities in rates of home ownership. So suburbanization mattered in terms of real estate markets. Second, in a period of the massive decentralization of commerce and of industry, a process that coincided with white residential movement to the suburbs, where you lived to a great extent, and to a greater extent over time, determined your access to jobs and to the consumer marketplace. 
Put differently, in a sprawling, increasingly sprawling, suburbanizing metropolitan area where jobs were locating uh, increasingly to the periphery, uh, African Americans were disadvantaged by their concentration in segregated neighborhoods largely in the center. Opening the suburbs mattered in terms of access to commerce and to industry. Next, and perhaps most importantly, the localistic political organization of the American state of government gave white suburbanites disproportionate access to political goods and resources, most notably public schools, but also other political goods that uh, in our decentralized, localized, balkanized system of government are disproportionately funded on the local level. Suburbanization could be seen, to borrow uh, a phrase uh, from the sociologist Charles Tilley, as a form of opportunity hoarding on the part of whites. That is, the creation of a spatial niche uh, that allowed whites to agglomerate public and private goods uh, disproportionately to their advantage. In this context of multiple reinforcing inequalities, in this context of multiple reinforcing inequalities, access to the real estate market, access to jobs in the consumer marketplace, uh, access to the political goods whose, uh, and resources uh, whose uh, access was largely determined locally, in this context of multiple reinforcing inequalities, the battle to open up suburbia had very high stakes. The struggle to open up the suburbs began in the 1940s and 1950s. And I'm going to focus mostly on this period, although I should say I write quite extensively about the 1960s and 1970s, but simply don't have time without smashing a whole bunch of stuff together uh, to go any further. I'm looking really at the formative, the critical moment in the battle to open up the suburbs, a moment uh, that provided all sorts of lessons for a future generation of activists. The struggle that began in the 1940s and 50s was deeply shaped and constrained, I would argue, by Cold War individualistic understandings of the causes of racial inequality. The period following World War II was a critical juncture in the history of race and civil rights in the United States. During the 1920s, and especially during the Great Depression, activists saw questions of economic and racial inequality, or class and racial inequality, uh, as fundamentally intertwined. They also looked uh, uh, to racial inequality in terms that later activists would call institutional racism, looking at the way that governmental structures and that economic organization created and perpetuated racial inequality. During the Cold War, that systemic or structural critique of racial inequality began to fall to the wayside, and it was replaced by an understanding of racial inequality that is still the prevalent one in the United States uh, in the present day. The key to Cold War civil rights uh, activism, to the strategies and to the vision of race was that a view of racial inequality as primarily a moral and psychological problem. It was, in the words of Gunnar Myrdal in An American Dilemma, um, and this was a book, I should say, that was actually published in two volumes. It's about 1,600 pages. Um, uh, uh, it's, it was a bestseller. It, it became enormously influential. It's quoted everywhere from church bulletins that I've looked at to African-American newspaper editorials to, uh, uh, to, to the signs that activists held. It, it was enormously influential on the grassroots. Uh, but it was one of those books that nobody read from cover to cover except for wonkish academics like me and some of you in the room. Uh, but... Gunnar Myrdal, very conveniently for the sake of his activist readers who didn't have time to plow through uh, all of his dense texts and footnotes, very conveniently italicized all of the key arguments in the book, usually right at the beginning of chapters. So you could read through and just skip from italic to italic and have all the takeaway points, which if you're looking to mobilize your church or mobilize your civic group or take your trade union to educate them on matters of race, um, was awfully convenient. Um, and the quote right at the beginning of the book that was italicized and appeared again and again uh, all over the place in the post-war period encapsulated this individualistic understanding of racial inequality. The Negro problem, Myrdal wrote in italics, the Negro problem is a problem in the heart of the American. It is there that the decisive struggle goes on. 
he, was, he said, I should say here, paraphrasing him slightly, it was not a problem in the heart of the American. It was a problem in the heart of the white American. Um, the American and Americans almost always mean white uh, in Gunnar Myrdal's text, but um, it's a problem in the heart of the white American. It's there that the struggle goes on. Activists all over the place, black and white in the post-Second World War II period, uh, especially at a moment when uh, a, a harder-hitting political economic analysis became nearly heretical during the Cold War, uh, began to embrace this understanding and this rhetoric and began to devise tactics uh, to win over the hearts and minds of white Americans. Ultimately, the goal of post-Second World War II civil rights activists what could be summarized in three words, depending uh, on, maybe four, depending on who uh, the activist was. Education, that is, uh, what, uh, what would later become to be known as sort of racial sensitivity training. Um, persuasion, that is, using hard social scientific data po popularized in the mass media to persuade whites uh, that African Americans were their equals. Uh, conversion, that is working through religious congregations uh, and through sermons and through, uh, 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 and through other uh, religious media to persuade white Americans uh, that uh, racial prejudices were immoral. And finally, therapy, that is uh, using social psychological frameworks and understandings uh, uh, to persuade uh, or to work uh, uh, with whites to get them to overcome their pathological irrational prejudices to educate, to persuade, to convert. These were the tactics that uh, motivated the first generation of activists who tried to break down the barriers of racial segregation in the post-Second World War II suburbs. Above all, northern activists trying to open up the suburbs hoped to persuade whites of the fundamental humanity of African Americans. That Negroes and whites, to use the ter terminology of the day, were just alike beneath the skin. The result of these tactics were extraordinary. And here I wish I was a high-tech lecturer and had some cool PowerPoints, but you'll have to create these images in your head as I talk. During the post-Second World War II period, advertising uh, took off, and uh, in some ways it's sort of the golden age of, uh, of mass marketing and advertising. And uh, activists uh, in the North, uh, mostly working through churches uh, and uh, through uh, trade unions uh, and through uh, private foundations, engage in an extraordinary uh, effort to market the idea of racial integration to whites. For example, uh, liberal newspapers and magazines, church periodicals, uh, 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 pamphlets that were prepared by groups like the American Jewish Congress and the American Friends Service Committee uh, touted uh, uh, examples of successful racial integration in suburban places. Typical one, and there are dozens of these, uh, a typical one appeared in the Saturday Evening Post in 1959, uh, a, a, a nicely illustrated, well-written story pitched to middle American white readers entitled, A Negro Moved Next to Me. Uh, in which the author uh, uh, talked about how it was uh, that the Negroes who moved into suburban Ashburton, Maryland, were really not scary. They were just like uh, uh, white suburbanites. They uh, liked to keep their lawns and, and plant flowers and sit in the kitchen and drink coffee uh, and, uh, uh, and, and were really just like whites beneath the skin. These were all over the place. And, and um, uh, I, I, I should probably put together like a little archive of all of these examples of pamphlets that were held out, uh, handed out on, um, on Brotherhood Sunday in mainstream Protestant uh, and Jewish congregations, or uh, uh, articles that appeared in ma virtually every mainstream periodical in the period, as well as local newspapers. At the same time, uh, grassroots uh, uh, um, activists used their connections uh, uh, through other media, particularly um, in film, uh, to uh, uh, portray both photographic and cinematic images of racial integration. The NAACP sponsored a whole series of films uh, that attempted to educate whites about the process of racial change in their neighborhoods. Um, these newspaper articles and pamphlets and posters and brochures also used the cliches of post-Second World War II suburban photography, showing uh, images of Identical ranch houses with white picket fences and African-American and white children playing together on the lawn, or a black woman and a white woman uh, both wearing their house dresses, um, sitting, uh, uh, having cake and coffee at their kitchen table. All as ways to engage in the process of education 
and persuasion. Ultimately, the punchline of this massive marketing effort was to persuade whites uh, that African Americans uh, were responsible suburban type homeowners worthy of inclusion in the American dream. It is impossible, uh, 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 or, or uh, let me put it a different way. The effect of these efforts to reshape public opinion, the effect of these efforts uh, through all sorts of media in the North to reshape public opinion were nothing short of extraordinary. Northern activists and their allies in the churches and in the media um, decisively delegitimated overt expressions of racial prejudice in the public arena um, in the mid 20th century. If some of you have looked at my Detroit book, will know that in meetings of homeowners in Detroit in the 1940s and early 1950s, whites regularly stood up, used the N-word, offered all sorts of overt, uh, nasty racist sentiments in public meetings, uh, uh, showed up at city council uh, meetings, and also offered these kinds of sentiments. Those kind of people didn't go away, but they got much smaller in number over the course of the period from the 1940s through the 1960s, largely as a result of this large-scale effort to delegitimate expressions of overt racial prejudice. In 1942, only a little more than one-third of northern whites, only a little more than one-third, approved of having even a single black neighbor in 1942. By 1963, 70 percent of northern whites expressed support for having a black neighbor or more. A very significant shift in public opinion in a very short period of time. But we do need, I should say as an aside, to be suspicious of what people tell pollsters and survey researchers. Um, but nonetheless, there's a sign of an attitudinal shift, a shift in what was considered to be an acceptable discourse in this period. But even if that attitudinal shift was unprecedented in scope and scale, translating professed belief into practice proved to be much, much, much more difficult. So to move from the abstract to the concrete for a moment, um, uh, I, I want to focus for uh, the last bit of my talk on a specific case, or really three related cases. Um, the battle to open up Levittown, Pennsylvania, and two other Levitt towns more briefly, one on Long Island outside of New York and one in New Jersey. While I focus on Levitt town because of its iconic status, it shows up in every textbook, every overview of uh, post-Second World War II America. It's such a cliche. Everyone who's read a high school history textbook or a college history textbook has seen the picture of Levitt town's curvilinear streets, identical houses, uh, kidney-shaped cul-de-sacs, uh, uh, and little 1,200 square foot asbestos or aluminum sided, uh, 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 very simple, affordable houses. They were iconic. And indeed, they were iconic at that moment. Uh, they became a symbol of American home ownership and the American dream nationally and internationally. Uh, in fact, Levitt-type developments got imported to other parts of the world uh, by Levitt himself, who built a Levitt town in Puerto Rico, uh, but also by many Levitt imitators who began to build mass-produced suburban-style developments uh, uh, in Asia and, and in Europe and in Latin America as well. So Levitt, uh, uh, the Levitt story I tell because it's iconic, but in my larger project, I write about lots of other suburban places, Cicero and Deerfield, Illinois, Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, Great Neck, New York, Dearborn and Livonia, Michigan, uh, Montclair, New Jersey, Shaker Heights. Um, many other places figure into my discussion of the battle over race in suburbia. But because Levitt Town uh, was so iconic, uh, uh, it's going to get my attention and yours this afternoon. Affordable housing for the common man was the promise of Levittown. These mass-produced houses really entirely remade American landscapes um, in the aftermath of the Second World War. William Levitt, who was the master builder, the proprietor of the company that built these Levitt towns, um, saw himself as a crusader. He saw themselves as a vehicle. He saw himself and his company as a vehicle for allowing uh, working class and lower middle class Americans to move into the mainstream of home ownership. And indeed, home ownership rates skyrocket in this period. About one third, not even one third of Americans owned their own homes in 1930. By 1960, uh, about 60 percent, almost two thirds of Americans um, owned their own homes. A very significant shift made possible in part by uh, the efforts of, uh, of, of people like Levitt. Levitt was also a cru political crusader. 
He saw, and this is another cliche that shows up in every textbook, he saw his communities as a bulwark against the spread of Soviet-style uh, uh, communism. Or, as he memorably put it, no man who owns his own house and lot can be a communist. Um, what Levitt didn't know, actually, was there were communists in all three of his Levitt towns, and they figured in the civil rights struggle because communists figured uh, in nearly every major civil rights struggle in the North and in the South in the mid-20th century. We'll come back to them in a minute. But Levitt's activism ended with his kind of crusading zeal about providing the home dream of home ownership. He was unabashed in defending the racial homogeneity of his planned developments. We can solve a housing problem, he said. Or we can try to solve a racial problem, but we cannot combine the two. Levitt uh, put restrictions on, rent, on rentals uh, and forbade the sale of homes in his, developed, uh, uh, his new developments um, to African Americans. Because of his prominence and because uh, uh, of the racial exclusion associated with his Levitt towns, he became a natural target for civil rights protesters. In 1949, a group of New York civil rights activists lobbied but ultimately failed to get the Federal Housing Administration, whose mortgage subsidies had basically made large-scale developments like Levittown possible. They lobbied the FHA uh, to incorporate an anti-discrimination clause to force Levitt to open up on a non-discriminatory basis. They failed. Unchecked by the FHA, Levitt defended racial segregation in his new Long Island Levittown. In 1950, in the late summer of 1950, the firm uh, uh, launched eviction proceedings against two families, two white families, uh, who were renting uh, in Levittown, the Noviks and Rosses. I'm pretty sure, but my evidence is anecdotal, not firm, that they were communists. Uh, but um, because they were doing what communist activists in 1949 were doing, which is they were self-consciously publicly flouting racial strictures. Uh, in this case, the Noviks and Rosses had invited uh, children of black friends of theirs uh, over to play with their children on the front lawn. They had uh, uh, violated the terms of their lease, which specified that the use of these premises by persons other than Caucasians was forbidden. Well, the NAACP filed a lawsuit. The lawsuit was eventually thrown out on a technicality, and this did not become the test case to challenge uh, uh, racial segregation in Levittown. In the meantime, civil rights activists continued uh, to work on New York's Levittown, and Levitt announced plans for a new, bigger, better Levittown uh, in Bucks County, uh, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. This was a metropolitan area, like many in the post-Second World War II years, had undergone a massive housing boom. Um, between 1945 and 1953, 120,000 new houses were built in uh, uh, metropolitan Philadelphia. Of those 120,000 houses, only 347 were open to African Americans. So when plans for the Philadelphia Levittown went public, the NAACP uh, uh, drafted letters to the FHA, to the governor of Pennsylvania, uh, used their clout in Washington to lobby the Truman administration, but again were rebuffed. In 1954, uh, no, sorry, 1955, in the immediate aftermath of Brown versus Board of Education, uh, uh, the NAACP uh, uh, litigation team, fresh off of its victory in Brown versus Board of Education, decided to file a lawsuit against uh, 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 the segregated uh, Levittown in Pennsylvania. Thurgood Marshall, who had just won Brown, uh, and Constance Baker Motley, who would later become uh, a prominent African-American woman judge, um, one of the first, uh, 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 took on the case. And they charged that Levitt's uh, refusal to sell homes to blacks violated the 14th Amendment and Pennsylvania law. The federal judge who heard the case threw it out. Uh, arguing uh, that uh, uh, Levitt was a private developer who could dispose of his property as he saw fit uh, and wrote a very terse, very um, uh, petulant uh, uh, opinion uh, dis dismissing uh, the lawsuit. While the NAACP was involved in this legal battle to open up the suburbs, uh, grassroots activists were also working quietly and behind the scenes to undermine Levitt's discriminatory policies. What Levitt didn't know or didn't think about was that he had plopped down his Pennsylvania Levittown 
in an area uh, of the North that was a real hotbed of civil rights activism. Uh, the Pe the Pennsylvania was a hotbed of civil rights activism in part because of the long history of Quaker activism. This was kind of ground zero of Quakerism. And uh, the Society of Friends of the Quakers who just won uh, uh, their American Friends Service Committee had just won the Nobel Prize a few years earlier for their work in war-torn Europe uh, with refugees uh, had now made challenging Jim Crow one of its highest priorities. And uh, they went after the guy who was practicing it right in their backyard. Behind the scenes, the Quakers, working with the NAACP and other local civil rights organizations, began to look for whites and for blacks who would sell uh, a white who would sell a home in Levittown to a black family and a black family willing to move in. What the Quakers discovered very quickly was it was possible to find a few whites willing to sell. Uh, mostly either uh, religious or secular leftists uh, who were living in Levittown. Um, a few uh, whites uh, uh, approached the Quakers when they heard about this, um, hoping to sell at a higher price because they knew that African Americans were willing to pay a premium, but most were doing it for more altruistic reasons. But it was very, very hard for them to find an African American willing to take the risk of moving into town. And one of the great ironies, and the Quakers, they leave such great records because they have a tradition of journal keeping. And so even their meeting minutes, which are usually, you know, resolution was held, vote was taken, 53 to 42 passed, um, you know, really boring minutes. The Quaker minutes are like six pages. Every, every little minute point is, is fleshed out. They're wonderful. And all the discussions that they had with prospective black home buyers are well documented, including how they dressed, their disposition, what they said. Um, and the Quakers even went so far, and remember they're a traditional peace church. M many young Quaker men had spent World War II in conscience and objector camps or in jail for refusing to serve in the military. The Quakers went so far as to go to Fort Dix, New Jersey to recruit um, African American military families um, uh, to try to get them to move into Levittown, in part because they believed that uh, military men uh, and their families would not be as frightening to whites uh, as non-military folks, but also because in, 19, in the mid-1950s, the military was the only significantly racially integrated institution other than a handful of trade unions um, in the United States. And so it was a natural place to go looking for perspe prospective black buyers. Still, they faced serious obstacles, and it took them um, nearly four years to find a black family willing to move in. In August of 1957, William and, William and Daisy Myers came forward as William Byers. Whoa. And uh, I don't know what, what happened there. William and Daisy Myers came forward as William Byers. Uh, the market was slow. It was a deep recession. And the house at the corner of Dogwood Lane and Deep Green Drive had been on the market for almost two years. A group of activists in Levittown mostly communists and Quakers and a few members of liberal Protestant congregations worked behind the scenes to lay the groundwork for the Myers family moving in. But what they got was a firestorm. The Myers were exactly the type of respectable suburban African-American family that civil rights activists were looking for to, to lead the shingles to fall away from the eyes of whites who would see in them the, the black reflection of their white suburban selves. Uh, Bill Myers was a World War II veteran. Um, he worked as a, a, a refrigeration technician, although the activists at that time called him an engineer to make him seem even more respectable. His wife was a member of the recreation board uh, in the local township. They, had, they were a baby boom family. They had three children, uh, and they aspired to having a little place for flowers uh, and uh, 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 a nice green lawn. Although a few weeks after the move-in, um, Bill Myers was spotted um, using his World War II rifle and bayonet to weed uh, 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 the grass out in front as a, as a state statement of resistance uh, uh, for the angry white uh, opposition that accompanied their move-in. Under the cover of darkness, the night after the Myers moved in, hundreds of angry whites gathered in front of the house. Nearly all of the windows were broken. Uh, the next door neighbors, uh, who were the strongest supporters in the community, both of whom were communists, had uh, the words KKK spray painted on their garage door. Uh, a prominent Quaker supporter who lived a few blocks away had a cross burned on his lawn. Uh, police and angry whites clashed in the streets. The owner of the house immediately behind the Myers house allowed his garage to be used is what reporters called uh, uh, an anti-integration social club where Confederate flags were waved and loud music was blasted uh, at all hours of the night to annoy the Myers and get them to move out. 
The grounds for this opposition were varied, uh, but most of them combined what you could say were white identity and economic or perceived economic self-interest. Fear, many, many whites feared that the presence of blacks in the neighborhood would lower their property values. Or as one neighbor told a reporter, Bill Myers is probably a nice guy, but every time I look at him, I see $2,000 drop off the value of my house. Others feared that they would lose their jobs uh, or face repercussions uh, uh, from their customers if uh, it was known that they lived with black neighbors. In fact, the uh, um, whites in the, in the neighborhood uh, went to the employer of uh, the person who had sold the Myerser house, uh, got him fired, uh, and uh, it took uh, the Quakers uh, and, and, and um, their connections in Philadelphia's economic elite to find the guy another job. Many Catholics in Levittown believed that civil rights was a communist plot. Uh, and believed uh, that uh, this was part of, of an effort to sow the divisive seeds of racial and class conflict uh, uh, to further uh, the goals of Soviet communism. But there were differences between North and South. The Myers were flooded with support from well-wishers, some of whom lived in Levittown, many of whom lived in other parts of the Philadelphia area. Hundreds of whites showed up bringing flowers and boxes of candy to the Myers family. Uh, in fact, the NAACP had to provide a subsidy for the Myers to provide coffee and cakes uh, and, and donuts for all of the white well-wishers who showed up uh, to welcome them to Levittown in the first couple of weeks. So there were differences between North and South. But Above all, what happened in Levittown, and eventually uh, with police intervention, things quieted down and the Myers stayed. Um, eventually, uh, what, what happened in Levittown dampened the optimism of many activists who believed uh, that appealing to the hearts and minds of white Americans would be the solution to racial inequality. The Levittown story had all sorts of unintended consequences. It was widely publicized, especially in the African American press. And blacks who read of the stories uh, both expressed their outrage uh, at uh, Levittown whites as being un-American and using the same Cold War language, arguing that they were furthering the cause of communism by resisting whites, uh, um, by resisting blacks moving in. Uh, but many African Americans writing to um, African American publications and speaking at civil rights meetings also expressed their uh, 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 increasing skepticism of the very goal of housing integration. Why should they put their lives, their families on the line in service of enlightening uh, some hardened, uh, hard hardened whites? Well, Levittown didn't, didn't attract a flood of black buyers. The Myers moved out in 1959, tired of their life in a national fishbowl. One other African American family moved in. Uh, in 1959, they didn't face any significant resistance. Things had died down. Uh, uh, but uh, the Levittown did not become a beacon of racial integration, nor did it become uh, uh, what whites had feared, a, a, a place that blacks were going to take over and turn into their own. Well, while this was happening, Levitt, uh, ever deaf to civil rights protests and ever uh, seeking uh, uh, new frontiers in the post-war housing market, opened up a third Levittown in southern New Jersey, in Willingboro, New Jersey. Here, and I'll just be very brief on this one, Levitt uh, faced the same cluster of black and white activists um, who also uh, uh, filed a lawsuit. Uh, in this case, however, uh, because of 1940s era and early 50s era civil rights activism, activism in New Jersey, especially led by the state's NAACP chapter, which was one of the um, largest and, and most crusading uh, of, of the era, the state of New Jersey had passed very sweeping um, civil rights legislation, um, sweeping legislation that gave uh, 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 um, uh, the NAACP uh, a, a, a wedge to use in New Jersey straight state courts. Levitt's attorneys fought, but in this case, the NAACP prevailed. Under New Jersey law, Levitt's new development in South Jersey had to be open on a non-discriminatory basis, regardless of race, creed, or color. From the outset, Levittown, New Jersey, was racially integrated. Um, and the Levitts, ever good capitalists, discovered that there was, in fact, a significant pent-up African-American demand for suburban housing. Uh, and uh, by the late 1960s, William Levitt had become a supporter, indeed, of the open housing uh, uh, legislation of 1968, uh, in part because uh, he saw the potential of marketing homes to African Americans who were seeking to live in suburbia, 
also in part because uh, he learned from New Jersey that if all of his competitors operate under the same playing rules uh, uh, that he does, uh, or that he did, uh, that this would perhaps not be such a detriment to his long-term success. So what can we learn from the uh, tale of these three Levittowns? Um, and I only mentioned the, the, the first and last very briefly, as other stories are much richer and more interesting. A few points. First, only a handful of northern whites, most of them religious or secular radicals, had anything more than a rhetorical commitment to racial integration in this period. Americans in large numbers professed their support for the ideal of racial integration, but they did not walk the walk. They talked the talk, but they did not walk the walk. When the moral vision of equality clashed with perceived self-interest, perceived self-interest won out. Next, open housing, as was evident in the case of Levittown and in all these places, had, and I would argue, still has a class problem one that came from its primary goal of trying to persuade uh, 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 whites of the uh, acceptability of potential black neighbors. The real problem in suburbanization, of racially segregated suburbanization, was the unequal access to power, to economic resources, and to political institutions, and to education, and so on. It wasn't that whites uh, were thinking bad thoughts about African Americans, uh, as activists believed. But the tactics of so much of the open housing movement in this period and beyond was to work not to, to challenge uh, these larger political or economic structures, but rather to try to continue to try to persuade or uh, to soften the hearts of whites in ways uh, that ultimately led many of them to overlook uh, uh, the problems of working class and uh, lower class African Americans. It would take a new generation of activists to show up in the next part of my book and the early 1970s uh, especially uh, to try to bring questions of economic and class inequality back into the open housing equation and they met with some serious obstacles. Next, the, the Levittown story and other stories like it throughout the North uh, uh, alienated African Americans in increasing numbers uh, from wanting to practice if not uh, uh, to practice uh, uh, racial integration. African Americans, by large numbers, like whites, continued to support the ideal of racial integration, but African Americans, based on their uh, knowledge of what was going on in Levittown and Deerfield and Cicero and so many other places, uh, uh, were skeptical uh, that uh, this, the goal of integration was worth the cost, at least the individual cost, uh, to them and to their families, even if by overwhelming majorities they supported the goal of racial integration in housing. Above all, when we look at the story of the Levittowns, um, uh, I'm sorry, above all, when activists looked at the story of Levittowns in this period and looked at, this, looked at the history of the first generation of efforts to integrate housing, they began over the course of the 1960s to come up with new strategies, strategies uh, that end ran around the limitations of efforts to win over individual whites, including trying to change local and state laws, zoning regulations, and land use rules as a way of providing uh, a, a bigger wedge into uh, uh, the suburban housing market than these individual efforts in the 1940s and 1950s had. Above all, we have to grapple in thinking about the paradox of, the, uh, uh, of racial segregation and residential segregation and educational segregation in the North. We have to grapple with the paradox shown in the story of the Levittowns. Challenging segregation in the most intimate arenas of everyday life requires getting at one of the fundamental aspects of racial inequality in the United States. And that is, it takes more than goodwill it takes more than good intentions. It takes more uh, than whites uh, professing that they are not racist and supporting the idea of racial uh, equality. It takes more than that to undermine uh, deeply entrenched racial inequality in the United States. As activists in the 1960s and 70s uh, uh, would discover and profess, it takes power. Uh, for as the great philosopher and theologian Reinhold Niebuhr uh, uh, argued, even when we consider people of goodwill, the majority of whites will not give up the privileges of their skin color unless they are forced to do so. Now, coercion uh, comes in many different forms. 
legal institutions, uh, rules and regulations um, offered by the state, uh, the pressure that activists put on the political system. Uh, but this was a hard learned lesson and a lesson that uh, only a minority of activists and only a minority of Americans learned in the aftermath of the failures to open housing in the 1940s, the 1950s, and the early 1960s. As we look out onto uh, the extraordinary shift in race relations in the United States, as we look onto the successes and victories, the triumphs of the civil rights movement, we also have to remember that in many crucial arenas, including housing, we have not overcome. The history of the post-Second World War II period, the history of the long 20th century and the civil rights struggle is a reminder of the creative power of protest but also a reminder of the political and social inequalities that continue to shape and constrain those struggles. The result is an incomplete revolution, a reminder that the struggle for race, rights, and justice in the United States, uh, despite its successes, still has a very long way to go. Thank you. If you, if those of you have to run off to Indians' uh, pre-game parties, uh, go for it. Uh, uh, otherwise, I'll open up the floor for comments and questions. Absolutely. Um, so please, um, comments and questions. Yes. Me? Yes, you. Okay. Uh, how can you say that uh, the Jim Crow is it, it isn't alive and well? Okay. When upon the, this very campus. Uh, Black students are, uh, are are stopped and, and questioned for no other reason than than for being black. And how can you say that Jim Crow is, is not alive and well when when within this very neighborhood, um, black folks are are, are killed and, and imprisoned uh, by by the police in, in, in great disproportion to, to their percentage of, in the general population. Oh, I, I, I think you misheard me if I said that uh, Jim Crow is now buried six feet under, um, uh, long and forgotten. Um, I mean, the, the real punchline of what I'm talking about here, and I didn't mention campuses or the police, except for briefly at the beginning, although it's a it's a critical issue. I mean, the rise of the of the prison industrial complex over the last thirty years um, uh, has had profound implications, and, and and became for very good reasons a major target of civil rights activism in that period. But I don't I don't mean to suggest for a moment that Jim Crow is uh, um, is is pushing up daisies um, at the moment. Um, uh, racial inequality is very much still deeply entrenched um, in in critical arenas of life, especially in the North. But the stories that we tell. The mainstream American narrative of, 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 of racial inequality and civil rights is that we've overcome, but the lived reality in the arenas of, uh, of policing and imprisonment, in the arena of housing, in the arena of education, in the fact that persistent racialized poverty still remains a major problem in the United States uh, uh, decades after the war on poverty are reminders uh, uh, just in those key arenas that the, the, the the, the racial inequality is still very much alive and well and deeply entrenched. It's not gone. So I'm sorry you mi misinterpreted my uh, my punchline. Yes, sir. I was encouraged. Um, there was a documentary. I guess it was a, um, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Little Rock, um, Arkansas um, segregation incident, and, and the number of those students that who had survived and gone on to do very successful lives, professional people. I didn't. I really had been educated in terms of the follow-up as to what happened to them, and most of them, at least the ones that were interviewed on television, seemed to have gone on to have very successful lives, and it was encouraging that having been through that battleground, they didn't just give up, that they they got through the, the horrible um, two years of being guided by National Guard to their classes, and somehow managed to um, go on to successful lives. So just, yeah, well, I mean, and the Little Rock story is a story that um, shows up in many different parts of my project. Um, civil rights activism um, throughout this period became, you could say, um, a, a kiln that fired uh, uh, and, and hardened this whole um, generation of activists. And it became a, a real um, springboard for, to mix my metaphors, of, of, 
grassroots um, activism, of political leadership. Um, if you look at um, some of the most prominent African-American political leaders today, so many of them cut their teeth in um, the community action movement of the 1960s or in community development corporations or in uh, battles to desegregate schools in the 1950s and uh, in the immediate aftermath of Brown. So, yeah, I mean, this became, in some ways, um, in the absence of more formal institutions that cultivated African-American leadership, became a real critical um, um, starting point. You could say, you know, uh, uh, to, to quote the old cliche, the sort of the school of hard knocks, um, uh, uh, really formed a whole generation of folks who went on to be very important community leaders who took their commitment to civil rights and, and continued it in many different arenas. Um, so I think the Little Rock example is one, you know, really good case study of the, of the, uh, the, the long-term impact of, of that kind of engagement now. When is your book coming out? Do you know yet? Uh, yeah, it's coming out too late for my taste, but it's, you know, it's coming out in September of next year. It's in the last stages of editing right now, yeah. Could you comment on Shaker Heights? Yeah, um, yeah. Shaker Heights, we'll come back to you. Um, Will okay. I comment on Shaker Heights? Shaker Heights is a really interesting place. You all know way more about Shaker Heights than I know about it. But um, one, I, I'll, I'll just say one thing about Shaker Heights, which is a reminder of, that um, efforts to appeal to the goodwill of whites in service of racial integration aren't enough. Um, Shaker Heights has... Um, uh, uh, succeeded in its fragile um, in, in racial integration in part because of its careful tending and, and kind of vigilance and reorganization of um, school attendance rules, to give you that example, um, as a way of preventing the resegregation of particular parts of the community in ways um, that um, uh, usually kind of reinforce residential resegregation. Um, it's one way in which, in other words, um, public policy has become um, in successfully racially integrated suburban communities like Shaker Heights or Oak Park outside of Chicago, to give another example. Public policy has become an essential, essential tool in, um, uh, in making that fragile experiment more enduring than it has been in most other places. And so that's my one punchline I can say on Shaker Heights. I mean, it's a, uh, a rich and very interesting and complicated history around Shaker Heights. Um, um, even in the 1970s, um, many Shaker Heights activists worried uh, sort of in the same ways that I was worrying at the end of my talk about the class implications of putting lots of energy into um, the suburbanization of African Americans um, because Shaker Heights was not uh, 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 doing what some other uh, uh, suburban communities were doing, which was transforming its, its local zoning ordinances in ways that would create large sections of or mix in sections of affordable housing as a way of opening up new opportunities. In part, it was largely built up, but, uh, uh, but also in part in many communities that tried to integrate the desire wasn't to provide greater opportunity for poor or working class African Americans. Rather, it was to bring in um, uh, um, people like us, that is, upper middle class, uh, uh, respectable um, um, African Americans. So the whole class issue um, plays out in much trickier and much more complex ways. Um, uh, and and uh, activists in New York and um, in Massachusetts in particular um, um, try to use the mechanisms of land use law um, and the incentives of state funding as a way of trying to um, interfere or, or um, um, work within the, 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 uh, uh, the, the real estate market to transform it, to open up opportunities for um, the kinds of African Americans who would benefit most from residents in suburban communities um, because of the growing number of jobs and, uh, uh, and, and consumer opportunities there. Yes, back here. Yes. Thank you, Doctor, for your scholarship. Um, and your synopsis of Shaker Heights is one of the main reasons we bought a home there four years ago, and I appreciate that. Um, you made a very poignant point about why <clears throat> possibly whites would not want to relinquish their privilege unless forced to do so. And are you saying that um, it's based on selfishness and self-centeredness and greed? And what can we do to assist that even outside of force? Because, you know, I'm not... Uh, a forceful person, but can we achieve those goals? Well, I, I'm defining force probably in the same way that Reinhold Niebuhr would define it in a very broad sorts of terms. That is, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not defining it in the way that, say, um, um, some activists in the 1960s do, which is we need armed overthrow of the, the of, of the current political situation in order to create. Ra ra in other words, coercion uh, uh, works oftentimes in much subtler ways. And Niebuhr himself saw nonviolent um, protests uh, 
of the sort that were happening um, throughout uh, much of the United States in that period as a way of forcing the hand of policymakers to respond uh, to grievances that they might otherwise ignore. But the law, um, uh, both uh, uh, in terms of um, providing dissentives uh, and incentives for uh, uh, for, for racial uh, dissentives for segregation and incentives for, for for racial integration can be a pretty effective tool, um, as can the work of um, quasi governmental organizations working. Uh, uh, I mean, another good example is Oak Park, Illinois. One of the tactics that Oak Park used to directly combat the fears of whites. Um, that they're we're going to lose value on their properties. And, you know, every time I see Bill Myers, two thousand dollars drops off the value of my house. Uh, was uh, during that critical period when African Americans were first moving in to offer insurance policies to any resident of Oak Park uh, that if the value of their property declined as a result of the diversification of the neighborhood, um, the, 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 they would pay out the difference. Uh, um, uh, I talked to a longtime uh, uh, open housing activist in Oak Park a few years ago. Uh, and, and she said that, to the best of her knowledge, um, they never paid out uh, uh, because uh, um, they didn't have to. Because, the pr because integration, uh, 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 as studies commissioned by some of these activists uh, uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, integration, they showed, didn't lead to a decline in property values. It was resegregation that did. It was resegregation and the disinvestment, uh, uh, absentee landlords, uh, um, people buying homes on land contracts, uh, et cetera, uh, that led to uh, a, a decline in property values in neighborhoods that were once formerly white. Um, and so Oak Park gambled sensibly uh, and in the process offered a little bit of a, you could say, a, 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 an economic reassurance to whites who were, um, uh, may have otherwise picked up and bolted um, had they feared that their values were going to go down. That's another quasi you know, public form of intervention in a market that um, that addressed one of the root causes of, of, uh, of, of white insecurity. Um, I have this, you, you made a statement that says that it takes more than goodwill, it takes power to break the strongholds of racial segregation. And my question is, um, what type of power are you talking about? Because every power that ever was formulated in this country <laughs> has always been um, infiltrated and brought down. Uh, that's a great question, and again, I, I guess I'll say I'm defining, I'm defining power pretty broadly, but I'm talking about, in some ways, I mean, to give you very practical examples from what I'm describing here, power is the NAACP in New Jersey forging complex strategic alliances with Jewish groups, with Catholic groups uh, 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 in that state to force a change in the state constitution and, in, and, and, and state laws governing civil rights um, to open up new possibilities for activism. Um, and I would say overall, one of the major lessons that comes out of my book, looking at a myriad of different civil rights struggles in different places throughout the North in the period, is the creation of unlikely coalitions, sometimes just temporary, sometimes just around a single issue uh, of folks who might not otherwise have common cause, but who bind together, uh, who glue together uh, to try to, to force political change, can be very uh, effective. Um, seldom uh, does a single group uh, uh, especially a single group of people who are relatively powerless on its own uh, a accomplish significant political change. They do so in alliance uh, with other groups with common goals. And um, the, the, the upside of the history of, of the North, and indeed the upside of some of the successful examples of racial integration in housing and education that occurred were precisely because of the forging of, of, of coalitions to force change on local uh, uh, political uh, officials uh, to force change in terms of the state or to work um, through litigation and, and through the courts to force change that way. Um, so I, overall, I would say that that, when I talk about power, is, is one very concrete way uh, in which activists try to change the rules of the game and sometimes succeeded in doing so. Well, I know there's lots more to talk about, but I'm, I'm conscious that there is things that other people may have to do. But those of you who want to stay and have a conversation, um, I think we don't have to vacate the room right away. So, you know, enjoy the moment of talking with one another. There may be things that you want to talk about or talk with Professor Segru about briefly. Otherwise, let's just take this moment to thank um, Dr. Segru for coming in here.
Thank you for your great questions. I'm sorry I didn't shave off another 10 minutes from my talk so I could uh, have 10 minutes more of Q&A. But uh, thank you all. Thanks for having me here. And thank you, Anne.